Are you feeling hungry? Well, here's a nasty fact to chew on. Every week, nearly 20,000 people get food poisoning, but it could be much worse. Yes, luckily for us, there's an army of nearly 3,000 public servants whose mission in life is to track down those people who sell us dangerous food. You know who you are, and so do the food inspectors. Over this series, we're out on the road with the food inspectors. So you need to get your act together. They discover the places where no one seems to know what they're doing. You can't have a rabbit where you're preparing food. You need to take the rabbit out now. Oh. Take the rabbit out now. And we discover the visitors that no restaurant ever wants to meet. You have so many live cockroaches there in the preparation area. What are you playing at? I reveal the truth about the hidden world of food crime that could put you in danger. What he's describing there is smuggling. It's a time bomb waiting to go off. And I find out how some of the country's biggest food manufacturers keep us safe. This doesn't look like a kitchen, this looks like a science lab. This week, our workers sleeping in kitchens and breaking hygiene rules. You've got a mattress there. A mattress. You've got dirty clothes in and people carrying out their pollution here. In Enfield, Mary finds the DIY repairs that could be a safety risk. You can't have cardboard or paper in the extraction filter. That could result in a fire. And I drop in on a man whose fridge hides a dark secret. It's like an old person's heel. <laughs> Now, if you go to your doctors, you hope they know exactly what they're doing. Exactly the same with a chef or a cook. And if they don't know about hygiene in the kitchen, the chances are the meal you've just enjoyed could be a memory for the wrong reasons. Cardiff. There are some 2,500 food outlets here, and they've all got to be checked out by the food inspectors. Today, we're out on the road with 26-year-old food inspector Mark Lee. He's only been in the job for two years, but he's already a force to be reckoned with. OK, we're going to a sandwich shop today. I haven't been there before, nor is the authority, so it hasn't actually undergone inspection by, um, by Cardiff yet. So I'm not really sure what we're gonna what we're gonna find. Well, this is it: the salad bar, owned by father and son team Alberto and Alex. The kind of place you'd pop in for a sandwich. Innocent enough, you might think, but as we learned earlier in the series, they can be a nesting place for bad bacteria. How the ingredients are kept is incredibly important. In regards to when you open things, say ham, packs of ham, things like that. Um, how many days would you keep it for? No more than three days. It goes by. Okay. In three days, I'm happy with that. That's fine. Um, and how do you make sure it's not kept longer than three days? Well, we check everything here. I mean, okay. I work six days a week with my father. So you're so always here. You know when you did time. it. Okay. Uh, Satisfied with Alex's storage room, times for ingredients, product. next is one of the most important questions the food inspectors ask: Is the fridge cold enough? <laughs> it's reading uh, about 8.7. OK, mm -hmm. it's not massively outside the temperature range we're looking for. All fridges and chillers legally need to be below 8 degrees centigrade, but the inspectors prefer closer to 5. Mark decides he needs to look at the storage fridge next. To get accurate readings, Mark probes the food. Anything over 8 degrees isn't cold enough. The temperature on this fridge um, is reading high, OK? It's reading at 16.2. That isn't good news. The temperature of the fridge isn't much colder than the outside. There's one solution, and it's going to be costly. I've got no real confidence how long it's been out of temperature control for. Okay. Um, so what we're going to need to do, we're going to have to waste some of these products. Okay. Waste is food inspector speak for throwing things away. What began as a routine inspection is quickly turning into a bigger problem. Just working out um, how long the product's been in there for uh, and which ones need to be disposed of. If it's saying specifically consuming within three days, um, that probably plays a bit of a risk, yeah. Mark takes no chances. Salad cream. Bottle after jar after bottle go straight into the bin. I don't like throwing food out at all. But it's just one of those things, unfortunately. Um, you know, it's got to deal with the risk there. So at the end of the day, although, you know, don't like doing it, it's just to protect public health. 
This lot has cost Alex and his dad around £50, so an expensive lesson from the food inspector, but a small price to pay for keeping the people of Cardiff safe. And we'll be back with Mark later to see if Alex manages to keep everything cool at the salad bar. Food business is big business, and it can attract people who cut corners, which can put you and your family and anyone who eats these foods at serious risk of illness. Tonight, I'm investigating beds in restaurants, the alarming practice of workers sleeping in kitchens. It's a human problem and a hygiene problem that could make our food dangerous to eat. We're on the streets of Newham, East London, with food hygiene officer Matt Collins. Today, he's on the hunt for food outlets breaking the rules. I'm going to give him about two seconds. I'm going to start poking around. For the first time last year, nine councils were given a total of nearly £2 million by the government to tackle migrants living in illegal accommodation, what's called beds in sheds. The council's are also looking for beds in restaurants. A bed. There was a fold-up bed in the shop. Matt Collins has found 12 cases of people living in kitchens in the last three years. So you're in and out of premises on a daily basis. That's your job. That's our day job, yeah. Um, does it worry you when you see accommodation and kitchens right next to each other? I like think that? it's very worrying. I think it's, it's totally unacceptable. The people that are managing the business are, are you know, not professional in their outlook. You know, nobody that was professional would have somebody living in a windows room at the back of their chicken shop. Jenny Morris is from the Chartered Institute for Environmental Health and was responsible for food hygiene at London 2012. She says anyone sleeping in a kitchen presents a clear health risk to the customer. For the record, this kitchen is perfectly legal in every way. The problem with buying food from restaurants where people live in kitchens are that the chances are much greater you will get things in the food that you don't want. That might be physical things. It might be bits of hair, it might be bits of nails, or it might be the bugs that you can't see. Bugs like Staphylococcus aureus. This is a bacteria that usually lives harmlessly on our skin and in our noses. But it can contaminate food if people are living or sleeping in kitchens. From their skin or from washing in sinks designed for food preparation. The results can be fairly spectacular. If you are unfortunate enough to eat food that has this bug in it, you may be ill before you leave the restaurant if it's a sit-down. It can be projectile vomiting within a couple of hours. Matt Collins usually acts on information from food inspector colleagues who think they've seen objects that shouldn't be there during routine inspections, things like dirty clothes or toiletries. I'm following Matt on patrol for the day. From Newham Council, I'm a food safety officer. Can I come through? Is there a bed or some accommodation in the back of the shop in? Who's in charge? Who's running the shop today? No, nothing at all. Have you got a basement? Yeah. Can I have a look in the basement? The first three are as clean as the proverbial whistle. Now we're on our fourth, once again acting on info that a colleague has seen unusual items. We've had a referral from another council department that there's somebody sleeping in the basement of this shop. Winnie's going to have a look to see if there's any uh, problem with food hygiene or means of escaping case of fire, health and safety, whatever. So that's what we're doing today. Let's check it out. OK. Of course, it's just a tip-off. It could amount to nothing. OK, my name's Matthew Collins. I'm a food hygiene officer from Newham Council. This is my colleague, Mr Bracken. I'm an enforcement officer. Uh, I've come here today to have a referral from one of my colleagues that there's uh, somebody sleeping in the basement of the... Or, sorry, in the back room of the restaurant here, so I need to come and have a look. Once he's in the back of the shop, Matt is clearly not happy with the state of the place. Nice well, quantity of flies. Well, this is... No, I'm not very happy with this at all, actually. Uh, straight away, uh, Matt's on the case. Um, in the back of the shop, it's still an interesting mix of uh, living area. We've got bicycles, sewing machine, and we've got uh, a load of rubbish as well. Excuse me. the room at the back here. That key to that door at the back there, I'd like that key, please, because we want to get inside that Definitely. room. Can you get me that key, please? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. 
The man says it's an office and that his manager has the key. But locked rooms get Matt Collins twitchy. While we wait for the key, it seems like a good time for some basic food hygiene training. This shouldn't be stacked here, you know, rubbish should be kept separate because it's dirty, clearly, from anything to do with food storage and food preparation. Your initial impressions, then, as you come through from the shop front into these well, two areas? Well, as we've moved back into the area at the rear of the shop, my, my, my impressions have been that uh, there's an unpleasant odour of decaying uh, food waste. There's also bits and pieces. There's a couple of bicycles at the back there. I mean, why would you have bicycles at the back of a, a chicken shop? A sewing machine, there's a shower here, and then there's a room locked at the back, which is where we believe that's interesting right there, mate. Look at that. Yeah, indeed. I mean, there could be a genuine reason why people need a toothbrush and toothpaste at work. They might just be very keen on dental hygiene, but they're all indicators that the back of this shop has been used as something rather uh, different from just food hygiene. They're, clue they're clues, though, rather than a smoking gun, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, indeed, we, yeah. we haven't actually found a bed here yet. No, but we're looking in that. We're, we're interested in that back room. That's the room we're interested in. Join me later when the key is found and all is revealed. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. It's estimated that there are over a million cases of food poisoning every year in the UK, and almost half of these are the result of some dodgy cooking by family and friends. So, are you a dining disaster waiting to happen? Well, I hope not. And to make sure, we'll be visiting a kitchen, home, workplace near you, and we'll be giving you some very useful cooking tips, because I'll be bringing our very own food inspector, Ben Milligan. Now, roast lamb. It's a British favourite. We spent £607 million on lamb last year. Served with all the trimmings, what could be better than a Sunday roast? And what could possibly go wrong? Today, I'm in Brixton to see Dave and Rich. They're cooking roast dinner for their mates for the very first time. The good news is, I've got the plonk. The bad news is, they're on the top floor. Party's already in full swing. In his spare time, Dave's a stand-up comedian. So, will this meal be a comedy of errors, or will his debut in the kitchen bring the house down? Well, in terms of his person, he's always very well turned out, always very stylish, presents himself very well. So, I'm hoping he'll be the same when it comes to cooking at this level. I hope he's got fresh stuff in tonight. And it's, it, it's a leap of faith, but I'm going to trust Dave on that one. Hey, Dave. Oh, hello, Chris. Yes. Oh, mate, I've come for dinner. Thank you very much. Here's a bottle of wine. Oh, bless you. Look ah, at where can I put my coat? Oh, look at this lovely joint of lamb. Are you a good cook? Um, I'd, I'd like to say oh, I'm kind of above sandwich. Right. Uh, but kind of below risotto. Right. OK, well, that sounds acceptable. Uh, mm. We are here to make sure you cook this and the rest of your roast dinner very, very safely. So I've got a bit of a surprise for you. Ben! I brought along my food inspector to make sure that every step is correctly taken and you don't poison your guests. Are you ready for this? It's a little bit scary. It should be. He is very scary. What are the concerns with a piece of lamb that we should be thinking about? What you should really do is treat raw meat as contaminated. Should you wash meat? If you wash it, there's a potential to splash the bacteria about the kitchen. The main thing really is to cook this properly now and kill any bacteria that might be on it. So 220 for two and a half hours, right? Say goodbye to your lamb. And in it goes. So, what do we need to know about cooking lamb? Well, like beef, E. coli can get on its surface. That's because E. coli is often in animals' guts, and this can get onto the meat during slaughter. So rule number one is to properly sear the outside of the meat at high heat to kill any bacteria. Then it's okay to serve pink, 
although food inspectors will always advise that pink meat is never risk-free. But be extra careful with rolled joints. Cook right through until the juices run clear. Well, that's the lamb. Now for the vegetable trimmings. Where are they? Let's have a look in the fridge. Uh-oh. The fridge is filthy. I think it's only fair to show Dave's guests before they eat his food. We've got the 29th of August for some... Oh, my word. Mushrooms growing mushrooms. That's are mushrooms. they dead or alive? What they are is a month out of date. What do you think, gang? Are you looking forward to tonight's dinner? <laughs> it's like an old person's heel. Mmm, cheese. Seven months out of date and still in the fridge. And then there's the swamp thing in the salad bag. It was pre-washed, but now it just looks prehistoric. Out of date food is bad. If it's past its use-by date, chuck it in the bin. The question is, are Dave's guests still looking forward to dinner? I'm sure we'll probably be fine, but it's a little bit worrying. Dave's veg trimmings were actually bought today and haven't touched the fridge, but he's not out of the woods yet. Do you use this for any other things? Uh, ge generally, generally carrots, sometimes potatoes. All right, so no meats on that. No, 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 no. We've got a separate chunk of wood for meats. Which is the yeah. correct answer, isn't yeah. it? But still be careful. Bacteria from the veg skin can get stuck in the surface of the chopping board. Ben, time for a tip. Right. You see, you take off these little bits. And you just play in the back, really, to a more level surface. OK. Trouble with veg is it can be grown in manure and, like lamb, can have E. coli. You've got how long have you got to cook vegetables to kill E. coli? Well, it's the same as other things, really. If it's been at 70 degrees for two minutes, you, you're likely to kill anything that's around. Brilliant. So, if you do like a bit of raw veg, wash and peel thoroughly. An hour later, it's time to serve up a delightful roast dinner for Dave's guests. Now we're talking. Yes. Here we go. Thank you, Sir, enjoy. They look quite happy, don't they? Yeah, I think you pulled out the fire. He did. Uh, would you eat it, though? No. Why not? Have you seen that kitchen? Yeah, it was pretty bad. How about that fridge, eh? Ah, oh, disgusting. For the record, no one was ill after Dave's dinner. We're in Enfield, North London, and with the food inspectors tag team, they're the Claire and Mary. Over the last few weeks, we've been with them every step of the way. They found the tips no waiter wants left behind. We've got droppings on this one. Ooh. A grizzly discovery out back. Is that just leaves? I'm not sure. And an unexpected guest who wasn't coming to dinner. Claire, I've seen a rabbit. <laughs> now they're about to do a spot check on a takeaway they last inspected 18 months ago. Then it was awarded a very solid four out of five hygiene rating. From the Enfield Council Environmental Health. We've come to do your food hygiene inspection, just a routine inspection tonight. Have they managed to keep up those high standards? The cleaning beyond there is appalling. Mm, it is out here. The rice, grains of rice all over the floor too. Claire, look. Your cleaning is very poor yeah, here. I always... No, this, this isn't, like... no, you're not cleaning that every night. This isn't just one day's worth of dirt. You might be sweeping, maybe, but no, this is longer than that. A dirty kitchen can be an inviting source of food for unwanted visitors like rats and mice. No sign of those here, but Claire and Mary are far from through with their inspection. Something smells around here. Everything's very greasy here. And look at how dirty those cloths are. On top of the dirt, Mary finds evidence of a clear fire risk. Can't have cardboard or paper in the extraction filter. 
that is dangerous and that could result in a fire. Okay. So you shouldn't have paper because the idea uh, oh, no, of this no. is to stop um, grease going up and smells and it's just not safe to have paper up there. Moving on, Claire is keen to check what is known in the trade as contact points, things you touch to you and me. The theory being, if they're dirty, then hands will be dirty when they touch the food. And also, your tap handles, if you go and feel the tap handle, it's very sticky. Can you feel it? It's all sticky. Because you're touching that, and if you come with me, I'll show you. I've just got that from inside here. In, in here is dirty. Because I don't know the ball hole here, I always just do it no, And that's right, but this is where people touch yeah. and their hands are dirty, so you need to clean inside of those areas. Yes. Mary thinks it's time for a few questions. How would they clean the surface? We, we use uh, the paper. Anything else? And we've got uh, the um, Mr. Mushroom. Right. No, this that doesn't work. Is. That spray's no good. It you do work. not have any antibacterial spray. Can you get someone to go and get some yeah, now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah? This is by no means the worst kitchen Claire and Mary have seen, but a series of small issues are adding up into a bigger problem. Next up, the fridge. It's some kind of sauce, but the issue with that is that the, um, the spoon is actually inside touching the food, so... Obviously, you can see in here that the hand contact surfaces are dirty. So if hands aren't clean, hands are going on that and the actual contact with the food. So obviously, there's contamination issue there. So food in here should be covered to avoid contamination. This is leaking, so it's actually uh, water's dripping into food as well. So there's a problem there. OK, so the fridge doesn't get top marks either. The owner knows that the food inspectors set high standards and that these visits are very important. She wants to do her very best to improve. I clean every, every day, but still not happy. Because do you know why? When you cook the smoke for everywhere, then you can't say everything is no oily, yeah? That if, if they check properly, safe for customer. Inspection over, and it's time for Clara Mary's verdict. Restaurant owners of a nervous disposition may like to cover your ears. I came to do the last inspection. You ended up getting a food hygiene rating of four. Restaurants are given a food hygiene rating from zero to five, five being the best. Depending on the inspection, this rating can go down as well as up. Because of what we've seen today, we're going to ask you to take that down. Yeah? You need to take that away. You're going to be a lot less than four. I was very disappointed. I did the last inspection 18 months ago. I gave it a, a full rating, which is very good. There was dirty cloths on nearly every surface. The cleaning on the floor was really bad. What is known as hand contact surfaces, door handles, fridge handles, light switches were all dirty. I think the major problem was that the chef uh, didn't have food hygiene training, so didn't appreciate the hazards. So food storage uh, was incorrect. He was storing raw food and next to ready to eat um, containers. Claire and Mary will revisit the restaurant in a few days' time to see if things have improved. We'll let you know what they find at the end of the programme. Back on the streets of London and we're looking at the problem of workers sleeping in restaurant kitchens. It's a very real problem. I think it's very worrying. I think it's, it's totally unacceptable. It's also seriously unhealthy. It can be projectile vomiting within a couple of hours. I'm out on patrol with Newham Council's Matt Collins. My name's Matthew Collins. I'm a food hygiene officer from Newham Council. Have you got a basement? Yeah. Can I have a look in the basement? Yeah. Earlier on, he wanted to find out if someone was living in a room at the back of this chicken restaurant. But the room was locked. I'd like that key, please, because we want to get inside that get room. Food. Now, workers sleeping where we eat is a hygiene problem, but more importantly, it's a human problem because we're often talking about vulnerable people on low wages. 
We've spoken to two restaurant workers, nothing to do with any restaurants we've featured, who agreed to talk to us on the basis that we hide their identity. Yeah, I sleep in the restaurant when I do work in the restaurant. When I work, I sleep in there. Sometimes on the floor, sometimes in the storeroom. They've got nowhere to sleep, nowhere to go, nowhere to go to work. They are all the time in the restaurant sleeping on the floor. It's no good. Over in East London, the key for the locked room has been found. Previously, remember, Mac Collins had been told this was an office. OK, so what have we got in here? We've got a mattress there. A mattress. We've, we've got, got a wardrobe. Personal effects. We've got some toiletries there. We've got dirty clothes in bags there. We've got a briefcase, a TV. I mean, I don't know whether that's working or not, but there's a TV in here and some bags of clothing. And then if you look in the, in the drawers, various other bits and pieces which suggest it's in use as accommodation rather than as an area where people just rest. In terms of food hygiene, what's the problem with this being here? This is a food preparation area. You've got dirty clothing and people carrying out their ablutions here in a room that leads directly on to a, to a room where food is handled, stored and prepared. I mean, it's not an appropriate use for it. Just as we were about to leave, the manager turns up and he's keen to explain it's not what it looks like. This is not a living accommodation or anything, it's just like a little bit of storage that we've got there. Just some old clothes or some old um, furniture, that's it. Because one of the guys got divorced, so he just chucked all his rubbish in there. There's a mattress in there, personal effects, yeah. and a wardrobe as well, which does make it look like a little oh, yeah, bedroom. Yeah, does, yeah, you can right. see why they might yeah. think that. Yeah, but it's not the case. Let's be clear about the outcome here. Even though Matt Collins felt the setup at the back of this restaurant was inappropriate, no evidence was found that someone was actually living there, and so no further action was taken. Inspectors like Matt Collins are in no doubt there is a problem here and in other areas around the country. What's going to happen then? Because as long as people are trying to make very quick money from chicken outlets, yeah. you're going to find the odd mattress in the back of shops as management changes and it comes through you're, again. You're absolutely right. You know, We walked through one business, we saw it was quite good at the front, and as we walked through to the back, it just dropped off. And that's, that, sadly, is an is all-too-common story. What I didn't know until today was what can lurk behind the counter, what's going on behind the scenes. And for the employees that have to put up with those kind of conditions, that is miserable. And it also has an impact on the food you eat. The UK food business is worth billions of pounds, and this is production on a massive scale. But along with that comes huge responsibility. One small mistake and their reputation could be in tatters. We've been given exclusive behind the scenes access to some of the leading manufacturers in the UK who have been showing us how they keep Britain safe. Now, if you were asked to choose the UK's favourite food, I wonder what would top the menu? Roast beef and Yorkshire pudding, bangers and mash, they'd be up there. But what about if I asked you to choose Britain's favourite vegetable? What would take pole position in a veggie pantheon of culinary delights? Well, believe it or not, it could be this. Yes, the pea. And you would not believe the care and attention that goes to bringing this humble green from a field like this onto your plate in pristine condition. Mm. Peas, innocent little bundles of tasty happiness. But these nuggets of green joy have to be lovingly cared for if they're to reach our plates in pristine condition. That's why we need some very special pea people. Richard Hurst knows what it takes to produce the humble pea. Now, let me just get down to the nitty-gritty, down yep. to the roots, because I've, I've picked up a little pod here. Uh, I picked it up about two minutes ago, yep. and you looked at me in alarm. Yep. Why? Once the peas are out of the pod like that, we have 150 minutes to get them frozen. Would there be bacteria on that? Uh, there, there can be bacteria, and the, the process of freezing and cooking beforehand will, will kill any bacteria that are on there. So it, it is about the safety of the crop, but also you know, making sure it tastes absolutely perfect as well. Getting the peas from pod to freezer is all about speed, and it begins with harvesting. It's a pretty impressive piece of machinery. 
you have to take any precautions with that? Yes, we do. We've got the picking height set so we're not picking up any rubbish off the floor, stones, any glass that might be in here. And also, we wash them down for two hours every day. Keeps any bacteria levels right down, reduces the risk of any contamination. OK, you keep looking at your watch. When did this field start? When did the process uh, we start? We started up 38 minutes ago. 38 minutes ago, yep. so by my calculations, 12 minutes before you're off to the freezer? That's correct, yes. 12, yeah. 12 minutes? 12 minutes before that load leaves, yeah. OK, yeah. mate, I'll leave you to it. I'm okay, off to the freezer. Good, yeah. See you later. With the food safety clock ticking in the race against bacteria, there's no time to stand around and chat. It's going to be very tight, this one. Once back at the factory, there's just 50 minutes for the peas to be sorted before they need to be frozen. The first machine removes anything that isn't a pea, such as stones, snails and stalks. They then go through a clever colour sorting machine, which rejects any remaining objects that aren't the luscious green we all love. With the clock running down, it's time to get a sweat on. It is hot and it is steamy in here. This is the blanching process. What are we doing here? We're killing the, uh, the microbial life, things like salmonella, E. coli, coliform bugs that naturally occur in, in, the, in the soil. At the same time, we're killing the enzymes which help preserve the integrity of the pea, i.e. colour, texture, taste. So we're making it safe and making it look good? Yes. OK, so they've been picked, sorted, blanched. Now it's time to chill it all down. It's cold in here. How cold? This room will run between minus 25 and minus 30. That is cold. Very uh, cold. I see the man behind him. He's got the big, thick jackets on. How long would we survive in here just like this? Uh, I'd, I'd imagine about half an hour. Right, let's do this quickly then. Yeah. Uh, what does it do to the pea? Well, it's individually quickly freezing each pea. There's air coming through it as well. It's keeping them separate. And what we're doing is any grub bug growth that won't have been killed has been arrested. At minus 18, there is no bug growth. So things like E. coli, if they're there, can't grow. Time to get out? Yeah. Let's go. Just 150 minutes ago, these peas were still in their pods. Now they're free from any nastiness and ready to be sent packing. So, here it is, the perfect plate of peas. And I can tell you, they taste absolutely delicious. So the next time you're tucking in, just have a think about how much hard work goes in to getting them there on your plate. So, to the frozen pea growers, the manufacturers, we thank you for keeping our peas safe to eat. And please, carry on protecting Britain. Matt, truthfully, tell me the most disgusting kitchen you've ever seen. OK, when I was younger, I knew this guy and it, it, his kitchen. Um, in this kitchen, everything smelled of cheese, except the cheese. Ugh. Yeah. Fridge, worst fridge you've seen? Uh, funnily enough, the same same guy. You open it, yeah, friend. And um, in his fridge, the, the crisper drawer for the vegetables, it was like silage in there. Oh. And where was this house? Funnily enough, he lived very close to me. Yeah. Mm. This kitchen, this fridge, it was yours, wasn't it, mate? Yes, it was. It's time to head back to Cardiff. Mark Lee is returning to the salad bar. Yeah, uh, nice to see you. Last week he gave Alberto and Alex their very first inspection. Always a nerve-wracking experience. And they had got a lot right, but some important things wrong. There was one problem Mark wasn't happy about. The temperature on this fridge um, is reading high, OK? It was reading at 16.2. The fridge was way above the legal limit of 8 degrees centigrade, and with prepared food, that increases the chance of nasty bacteria. Gonna have to waste some of these products. It's never nice to see food wasted, but this lot had to go. Mark ruled that around 50 pounds worth of ingredients should be binned. The mayos. That's mayo, isn't it? So it's a tense moment today for Alex as Mark re-inspects the fridge. Um, just gonna check the temperature. Hold on. It's still 16 degrees centigrade. That's the same as last time. 
But this time, what's in the fridge makes all the difference. They're not storing high-risk food in here now because um, I don't think it can hold temperature is what it should do. Um, it's just low-risk food in here. Things that aren't prepared, so the whole tomatoes, um, the lettuce hasn't been prepared yet. The fridge isn't really doing its job. It's more like an illuminated cupboard. But Mark's satisfied there's nothing here to worry about. What about the deli counter? Last time, it was just over the 8 degrees centigrade limit. Took some temperatures of rice, which was 6.2. Um, and also um, some temperatures, it was some of the salad items at the top, some tomatoes, which was 5.9, which I'm happy with. All the high-risk items are where they should be, down the bottom, um, and kept cold under the right temperature control conditions. Now it's time for the verdict. Um, Alex, really happy with everything you've done, really happy. Some of the stuff I'm going to come back and discuss the paperwork in a couple of weeks. Okay. But apart from that, I'm really happy with everything you've done. As we know, food inspectors have the power to award hygiene ratings. Alex is currently on a two, but he's got his sights set high. I understand the fact that I didn't have some things in order, but... Uh... Three months from now, I will have everything in order and hopefully I aim for my five stars, which is what I want. Britain has a great tradition of small food producers, small outfits providing big flavours. And these foods often come straight from the farm onto our forks, so getting it right can be make or break, because these people are directly responsible for everything they sell. Who are these self-contained heroes of the food chain? It's time to meet the producers. Farmers markets. Celebrity chefs are always banging on about farmers markets. How you get to meet the producer face to face. The food's more authentic. You can ask questions. Well, I tell you what, Jamie Ramsey, not everybody likes farmers markets because they're a bit too natural. And nature, by its very nature, is filthy. So how do you shop at a farmer's market and stay safe? That is Somerset. There is a farmer's market somewhere down there. Shall we? This farmer's market in Taunton is pretty typical of hundreds of similar places across Britain. This one's been happening twice a week for five years. I've come to meet Carol Slinger, head of training at the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health. People who sell food to the public can take an exam, and Carol sets the exams. If anyone can settle my nerves about buying food that isn't sold under strip lighting, then she can. First up, the bit of my dinner that is not too veg. So, Carol, we've got this beautiful meat laid out here, but the idea of it being outside like this just gives me slightly collywobbles, just a bit. Well, it shouldn't do, really, because... It's in polystyrene boxes, and you'll find some ice packs underneath there, which are keeping it quite cool, and it's all vacuum-packed. The vacuum packing removes all the oxygen from around the meat, and a lot of bacteria need oxygen to multiply. OK, so it's no more dangerous out here, the way it is right now, than if it, it was in a supermarket or, or anywhere else, in a butcher's? No, because they'll be constantly checking that the temperature's kept cool enough, which is below, legally below 8 degrees. Now, what if I'm after putting my beef in a little sandwich? See, in my mind, I'm not really worried about bread. No, you shouldn't need to be, because bread is a very low-risk food because of its dryness. I notice that you are rocking the Michael Jackson look, and you've got one gloved hand and one ungloved hand. Right. Yeah. What's the thinking there? Well, it's a very well-practiced market technique where I can handle the bread with one hand, but money being one of the dirtiest things, you don't want to handle that and handle food in the same hand. So this hand is well-practiced at handling money and change, and this one handles the bread, and that's... That's our standard practice with all our market crews. Is that uh, by the book, Carol? It is absolutely. It's good practice. So bread you eat in one hand, bread you spend in the other. And what goes well with a hunk of bread? Let me think. Oh, cheese, yes. Now, the thing to ask about here is whether it's unpasteurised. If it is, young, sick, elderly or pregnant are advised to stay away. I'm learning a great deal today. I've even taken a short course in Japanese. Uh, a sushi stall. Look at that. Hajime Maste. Hajime Maste. How are you doing? You're right. <laughs> Good, thank you. Okay, so here we've got rice, 
We're looking at cured fish, things like noodles as well. Um, what should I be looking out for as a customer? Well, with rice, there is a particular problem sometimes in that rice can have a bacteria in it called a psilocereus. So that's one of those bugs that even cooking won't help get rid of. It can stick around. It will kill bacteria, but it won't kill the spores of the bacteria. So once the rice is then cooled, there's moisture there, so the bacteria can germinate from the spore form and then start multiplying. So once the rice is cooked, it should be cooled and kept chilled while it's being displayed like this. And this rice is spot on. God, he speaks Japanese. Now watch as I prepare to reveal one of the mysteries of the world of food. OK, now, this is an interesting stall, because over here we have raw meat, uh -huh. and over here we have cooked, cured meats, bacons, things like that. Good afternoon. Hello. How are you doing? Now, what I don't understand is how you take a, a piece of pork, leave it hanging for how long? That, this one is probably four weeks. Four weeks. It's just hanging. So. How can that not be off? Well, it's been cured. It's been treated with salt and sugar and kept refrigerated while it's drying. And that kind of atmosphere, the, the bacteria can't multiply. Any chance I could see how this is made? Yeah, I'd love to show you. Yeah? Yeah. That's good. Let's go. I'll be back later in the show with stall owner Donna Lucking as she reveals the secret of safe salami making. And it's a practical. Do you want to have a go at filling it? Well, yes. <laughs> how hard can it be? That's a thing of wonder, though. Look at yeah, that. Look at that, yeah. First, though, here's a quick recap about shopping safely at a farmer's market. Any fresh meat should be chilled below 8 degrees. Below 5 degrees is ideal. Check if any soft or blue cheese is unpasteurised. Pregnant women, the elderly and very young might want to give this a miss. Anyone handling unwrapped food and money should use different hands for different jobs. Remember Michael Jackson. Rolling into Rygate and Banstead is food inspector Russell Jenner. He's here to sheriff the area's restaurants and their kitchens are his Wild West. This back door's pretty dirty. Yeah, yeah. Russell's been inspecting kitchens for a quarter of a century and today is about to make an unannounced spot check at an Indian restaurant. We haven't been there for about 18 months. They won't be expecting us and it'll be interesting to see whether they're keeping up the cleaning here. On the last visit, the restaurant impressed Russell, but hygiene habits change and that's why the inspectors make regular checks. As with any inspection, Russell wants to start by washing his hands. All kitchen staff should be doing the same before any food preparation. Oh, one, one. When did that happen? Uh, two days ago. Two days ago. So the sink was broken two days ago by a falling meat skewer. The new hand basin has arrived, but is yet to be fitted. It's a good excuse, but hand washing stops for nothing. How are you washing your hands? Yes, of course, all the time we are washing hands. Yeah. How are you washing your hands? Your wash hand basin. Antibacterial, soap, liquid, soap, this is all of the soap is there. Are you using this one? No. Yeah, this is soap, we are using it. So where are you doing it at the moment? At the moment, we are now are using this one. Okay. For, for, for one week. All right. That, that's... Because as soon as possible, we'll... So right, just just tell me the way it is. That's fine. Because this is their rule, actually. Okay, I mean it's not ideal. You need you need that, but yeah, of course we need. Yeah. Okay, the hand basin needs immediate attention. Russell couldn't be clearer. Now he's finally ready to start the inspection proper. That's used for pop doms. Yeah, pop dom, but we need to clean it now. Now it is actually yeah. empty. But, but so the thing is, when you put your pop doms in there to drain, there's a lot of oil inside the pop dom. Yeah. It is a pry by the oil. You can't use newspaper, you see. I want the pop doms to go because they've been in touch with that greasy. Oh, okay, so that's okay, we'll turn it to yeah, as soon as possible. Yeah. As soon as possible now. They're going to put them in the bin? Yeah, bin. Yes, of course. Of course. Of course, of course. Bin, of course. No, not those. No. The actual poppadoms? Yeah. Yes, it does. Okay, okay no problem. I'm going to put this in the From cooked food to raw, Russell is keen to know how they handle their meat. 
So what have you got in those bins there? What's that? Fresh meat. Fresh meat. Fresh meat. Fresh meat. Fresh meat. Fresh meat. The staff show Russell the meat, and it leads to an impromptu lesson in food hygiene. He took the red meat container that was in touch with the red meat, so it had red meat juices all over the bottom. Absolutely. He put it on there. Mm -hmm. This is now contaminated. You've now got a green knife. Okay. It's contaminated with the juices from that. Yes. That's, That's cross-contamination. You must do all your raw meat preparation and then clean down and sanitise. Now there's a lesson for all of us. To stand any chance in the fight against cross-contamination, you need the proper kind of cleaning kit. And what are you using to clean it? What, antibacterial? Uh, yeah, of course, antibacterial. Can I, ha can I have a look at that? Of course. Okay. The staff here pride themselves on running a tight ship and go quickly in search of the sanitizer. But for the moment, it's proving elusive. If you can't find it, you can't use it. We don't know where it is, but it is here. To the naked eye, this kitchen looks pretty clean, but what you can't see is just as important. So where is that sanitizer? That's range cleaner. Yeah, yeah, everything pretty nice. I haven't seen any sanitizer yet. Sanitizer. I can't find any. All I can see is oven and fry fryer cleaner. Mr. Muscle window and glass. An oven cleaner. Yeah. So I haven't seen anything for cleaning those surfaces down. You've got this one. But it's got no label on it, and I can't. That's made up from some sort of concentrate, and I can't see the bottle of concentrate. So, yeah, actually, maybe this is also some sanitizer, but well, maybe it is, maybe no, it, maybe it isn't. It, it is actually, chef, no, this is sanitizer, actually. Maybe just yes, sir. This is sanitizer, actually. <laughs> you can tell by spraying yeah. it. Yeah, we just, oh, we just actually, maybe she's yeah. doing it. This does, in fact, turn out to be the sanitizer. They had it all along. Good for them. It's not always easy being questioned by the food inspectors. The great sanitizer hunt ends happily, but the sink and the poppadom storage still need to be put right. OK, so what I'm going to do now is going to write up a basic report mm -hmm. and I'll have to write you a detailed letter. Okay, okay. I'll have a quick word with your chef on the phone as well. OK? okay. Thank you. Russell will return for a follow-up inspection. We'll let you know what he finds at the end of the show. Once again, I'm talking about food poisoning from my food lab and how it affects your body. I've got another terrible story to tell you and a few tips to make sure you don't become another victim. This is the story of Kevin Hughes. He lives in North Wales with his wife, Chloe, and two-year-old son, Harry. He is an extremely keen footballer. He plays two or three times a week. Well, he did because one day he decided to grab a sarnie at a local deli while he was at work. It was just the usual uh, Monday. I uh, went for my break, didn't bring any uh, lunch for me, so I went to... Uh, uh, local deli shop and just got a uh, chicken sandwich from there. Kevin suspects but can't prove his visit to the deli led to hospitalisation and a violent bout of illness he'll never forget. Then uh, in the afternoon I just started to feel unwell, started to have aches and pains and I was up for most of the night throwing up and having diarrhoea. What Kevin didn't know was that he'd picked up a very serious case of food poisoning caused by the bacteria Campylobacter, which we've talked about before in this series. It's a growing problem. In 2011, there were over a 1,000 more cases than in 2010. It enters the stomach, invades the small intestine, and starts dividing. This causes disease in the surrounding environment, which in turn makes you sick, as Kevin knows all too well. I didn't move out of the bedroom the whole time apart from obviously going to the bathroom. On Sunday night, I couldn't sleep. This was possibly about midnight, going downstairs, and just remember that, that time, just sitting on the toilet, completely drained. So you're in a bad way now, mate? Yeah, really bad way, yeah. yeah. We're talking about six days of constantly going to the loo, constantly yeah. being sick. Yeah. So hands up, who knows why we should never eat undercooked chicken? Stand by, here comes the science. One of the most popular breeding grounds for Campylobacter is unpasteurised cheese and milk, but this 
is the biggest culprit of them all. Campylobacter lives harmlessly in the guts of this animal, but can contaminate the flesh when it's slaughtered, as can contact with contaminated faeces. And this is where it gets dangerous, because if it gets inside of you, it can make you very ill. Kevin was now in big trouble. Seven days after eating his sandwich, he was admitted to hospital. One of the specialist doctors came to see me and said that it's very rarely they've seen anybody suffer so bad from it. And the reaction that my body had to combine it back to, they thought I had a problem with my immunity. They kept me on the drip uh, up until Friday. Five, so five days. days on the drip? Yeah. My goodness. So thankfully, um, you're well now. Yeah. Are you 100%? Are you back to where you were? No, not at all. Uh, Any time I'm really off work, it's all stomach-related. Even today, Kevin is still extremely cautious about eating chicken. I still eat out now, but any time I eat chicken, if I'm in the restaurant, I'll cut through it, make sure it's cooked thoroughly. If I, even if I have a sandwich out now, I'll open the bread, look on it, because I didn't, don't want to get that type of food poison ever, ever again, really. Campylobacter is the number one cause of food poisoning in the UK, and a whopping 18% of all the raw chicken we buy is infected by it. That's around one in five chickens. But how do we know? That chicken hasn't got it, nor's that one, nor's that one. But this one has. You can't tell when you buy it, so all you've got to do is make sure you cook it properly. So how do you avoid Campylobacter? Well, when handling chicken, wash your hands regularly. Keep raw and cook meat separate in your fridge raw meat at the bottom. Cook chicken thoroughly. At its thickest part, the meat should read at least 75 degrees Celsius with a meat thermometer. Now, back to the producers, the brilliant people who often take our food from farm to fork and, as a result, have a huge responsibility to get the hygiene absolutely bang tidy. I've learned all about shopping at a farmer's market, but the ways of the salami are still hidden to me. It's a mystery. How you take a, a piece of pork, leave it hanging for how long? That, this one is probably four weeks. How can that not be off? Stallholder Donna Lucking has very kindly invited me back to her farm to find out. Donna is a small artisan producer on Ellis's farm in Devon. She's been rearing Gloucester old spot pigs for the last nine years. Her mantra, happy pigs are tasty pigs. Oh, wow. That's where the magic happens. Yes, this is uh, cutting up the meat, preparing it for the salami. What do I need to do? <laughs> right, we've got a white coat there for you. Right. If you want to wash your hands at the hand wash basin, and there's a scrubber there to scrub your nails. Lovely fatty pork here. Yeah. OK. Uh, that's not going to fit into a sausage. No. Do you see how observant I am? <laughs> You're learning. You know, all the way. <laughs> now, Donna says her cooked meats have a shelf life of five to ten days, but her pork salamis, which are dried and not cooked, last 40. How on earth does that work? It's like a very fatty bit there, lovely. Different producers use different methods to preserve the pork meat. Donna uses the very freshest ingredients and then adds a bit of magic we've had for centuries. Salt. We're going to give it away because we've got to get the exact amount of salt to cure it properly and effectively. The salt acts as a stabiliser, preventing the growth of bacteria, but it has to be in exactly the right amount. 22 grams per kilo of meat. Why is that so crucial, then, to get the amount right? Because that's the crucial amount. It's got to be um, that to cure it and kill all those bacteria that we don't want in the salami. So which bugs is it you're trying to eliminate from, from that meat? Listeria or botulism. That's the main big ones that, that can survive in raw meat. Do you know what botulism can do to you? Just scare me a bit. <laughs> well, the main thing, it probably could kill you. <laughs> OK, that's bad enough. That's pretty much as bad After as it gets. making you really, really ill. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's yeah. a big one. You add lovely wine and herbs, and then another key part of making sure your salami is safe is in the way you mix it up. 
So mixing is crucial because if the salt ends up patchy and in one spot or another, there's a piece that won't be properly protected. The You've mixture's not there. Every precaution all the way along the process. Now for the fun bit. I've waited for a very long time to get my hands on one of these. Do you want to have a go at filling it? Well, well yes. <laughs> How hard <laughs> could it be? I mean, seriously. <laughs> this is the birth of a salami. Beautiful. That's a thing of wonder, though. Look yeah, at that. Look at that, yeah. Now it just needs to grow up. Four to eight weeks spent at the correct temperature and humidity. OK, there we go. Fantastic. Let's take it into the drying room then. Sure. Is that all right? A little precious salami. A little bit proud. <laughs> I'm a little bit proud. Oh wow! Yeah, look at that. When they're mouldy like that, that's the way they're supposed to look. Yes, that's the way it's supposed to, to be. F A S Q. Frequently asked salami questions. The mouldy-looking skin. Can you eat it? It's safe mould, it's a penicillin, there's a couple of types of penicillin, so it's absolutely safe, but you don't have to eat it, you can um, unpeel it. I didn't know that. The outside of a salami is penicillin. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So, if you like the skin, eat the skin. The mould is friendly, it's edible, incredible. So once you've done your bit, you've made the salami, you've sold it on, what about people at home? What do they need to do with the salami? Can they hang it up for as long as they want? Yeah, well, you need to look after it when you get home. You need to give it the same sort of uh, attention, because if you put it in a fridge in a plastic bag, it will go all sweaty and horrible. It needs to be free and breathing. It's a natural product. So keep it in the fridge, um, wrapped in some greaseproof paper or brown paper. But, yes, don't just, just hang it up in your kitchen that's warm. It's best to keep it safe in that fridge. If I do nothing else, until the end of my life, I can now say I have made a salami. Thanks to you. <laughs> I've contributed. I've helped. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Really nice to meet that. you. Thank you. <laughs> Now, earlier in the show, Russell Jenner in Rygate and Banstead and Claire and Mary in Enfield both gave restaurants thorough inspections. Both have now been re-inspected, so what happened? Well, Russell's Indian has replaced the broken sink, sorted out their poppadom storage and the place is now looking very clean. At Claire and Mary's Chinese, the cardboard fire risk has been removed from the extractor fan. The kitchen has been deep cleaned and they brought in sanitizer to keep the work surfaces clear from bacteria. Great results all round. If you do want to find out more about the place you're about to eat, then you should check out its food hygiene rating, which goes from a five, very good, to a zero, pretty awful. And at the moment, it's not compulsory to display one of these certificates in a restaurant window. So if there's not one there, you might want to ask yourself, why not? But you can check online. Just go to www.food.gov.uk. And yeah. there's also an app for your smartphone. Is there? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, very good. See ya.